welcome to our blog. And today I am with Dr. Wayne Price, author of a bunch of books, um, The Abolition of the State, Marxist and Anarchist Perspectives. Let's see. Um, I believe you wrote a book on Marxist economics for anarchists. Um, and you've been kind of one of the key people in and trying to maintain a a dialogue between Marxists and anarchists that doesn't also like short sell or hide or obscure anyone's actual historical position. So um, I wanted to talk to you today about where you thought Marxist and anarchist relations are, particularly with this seemingly uh, ubiquitous repopularization of Marxist-Leninism, which seems to be on the horizon these days. Uh, well, uh, the biggest upsurge in socialism mm -hmm. has been uh, through the DSA and similar groupings, and they have been uh, starting out from a, a social democratic, reform socialist, reform state socialist perspective, although, as you say, there's also a, a mixture in there of uh, turning towards Marxism-Leninism as people look for a more solid uh, ideology or background, something that to give them backbone to understand what's going on in the world. Uh, <clears throat> and we, we've seen uh, people uh, from these tendencies, uh, for example, uh, uh, calling themselves democratic socialists, but still uh, rejecting uh, supporting the Cuban government when there was a rebellion in, in Cuba, the demonstrations and so forth, or uh, ref refusing to support the Ukrainians and supporting, uh, well, they wouldn't say supporting the Russians, supporting for peace, but in de facto supporting the Russians. And uh, we see even now uh, with the uh, uh, Israeli uh, 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 Palestinian war going on, a, a uh, support for the Palestinians, the result of the good, but a refusal to uh, criticize uh, Hamas or to criticize the, the original massacre. Uh, so that's all there, but their main tendency of the socialists has been uh, electoral, mm -hmm. particularly towards the Democratic Party, which doesn't necessarily conflict with Marxism, Leninism, since after all, the Communist Party spent years uh, and still does uh, working its way inside the Democratic Party and supporting uh, mostly Democrats and for, for, for elections. Uh, <clears throat> and the uh, minority inside the party is uh, always ra raising the possibility of breaking from the Democrats, but that possibility is always put in form of uh, uh, forming a new party, just continuing the policies of electoralism. Uh, a Labour Party, a Workers' Party, it's a, a, a left liberal party, the, the Green Party, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, it's it's striking, in fact, how little discussion there is uh, of revolution. Mm. You can read, reading Kim Moody's recent book on on labor and uh, pull, he's very critical of the Democratic Party and of those who are supporting the Democratic Party, but he's still coming out for a new party. And uh, there's no place in the index is there a reference to revolution. It's just not a thing you talk about among decent people, I suppose. The uh, even those who are for a new party uh, do not say, well, well, we will tell the people that, uh, in fact, we know that uh, running in elections, we can't actually change fundamentally and, and that we're going to need to smash the state and overturn and create new al alternative institutions. Uh, but if we think back towards the last great radicalization back in the, uh, the 60s, uh, the biggest turn on the left, uh, I mean, there were mass, the mass movements, of course, were uh, uh, the struggle for black liberation, uh, starting in the 
who start at a very moderate kind of level, uh, uh, civil rights, nonviolence, and so forth, and uh, the anti-war effort, uh, which was hard to do in a modern fashion because it was the Democrats, in fact, who were running the war. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the biggest part of the left, of the young left, the new left, began through the Socialists for Democrats, I'm sorry, the Students for Democratic Society, the SDS. Mm -hmm. I was a member way back then. And uh, it began, that began as the youth group of the League for Industrial Democracy, which was run by a bunch of uh, funny daddy social democrats, including uh, their their youth part was uh, Michael Harrington, mm -hmm. of, the, of course, of the DSA. Uh, and so they were also committed to supporting Democrats and keeping things very mild and moderate and so forth. And uh, or at the most, there was sort of a, a tension going both ways. And it took some years before uh, this movement radicalized. As I say, the fact that the Democrats were running the government at that point uh, was part of the thing. And uh, that they grew about, uh, you know, a large number of people who regarded themselves as revolutionaries. I think one poll at one point said that there were about a, a million people in the United States who regarded themselves as revolutionaries. So this was, uh, so it took a while. And I think that's going to be true here, too. I believe that even though the movement starts around the Democrats and we have our, uh, they move from being the, the, the center-right Mm -hmm. to open up a left wing to bring together the uh, the draw in the uh, democratic socialists uh, the, the 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 squad the quad whatever the squids to uh, OAC and, and others and to make room for you know and, and uh, even Barry uh, uh, even Bernie Sanders who actually in fact has never has never actually joined the Democrats. Even we ran for president on uh, tried in their former primaries uh, to open up for that, but in spite of that, of course, you know, at some point uh, people realize that they're really getting nothing. And in fact, a lot of people are realizing it right now with the growth of the uh, uh, anti uh, movement, the, the the ceasefire movement, the mm -hmm. anti zionist movement in this country, uh, which is very thrilling and you know a real big opening to the left. Uh, and the biggest thing, the barrier to that, of course, is that, you know, the bourgeoisie has playing good cop, bad cop, Biden being the good cop, and uh, uh, the miserable wretch Trump being uh, play, being the bad cop. And people are, you know, frightened of that, and that's the strongest defense of uh, pushing towards uh, uh, holding back the independent movement. I don't know if I said anything. Right? No, you did. I, I wanted to ask you, um, there's two kind of tendencies that I've seen in the past, uh, say, let's say 10 years that led us to here. One is um, anarchism as it was kind of represented by its, you know, a, a trend that I've seen you criticize as highly reformist, the kind of Graeberite, like, MMT hybrid anarchism, which I've always found very strange because I've never been able to figure out why an anarchist would endorse state theory of money as a positive thing. Um, uh, that seems to have faded into the 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 social democrats uh, somehow, uh, and and it's interesting. I was I had read uh, Ron Tabor's book. It's not a uh, the the. The tyranny of theory, which is not a book that I love, but he did make this observation that the way that Occupy was unfolding, that there would be a move into the social dem social democrats, and that he thought that would also lead to a move into a revival vitalization of Marxist Leninism as people got frustrated with the social democrats, and he was quite concerned about this. Um, and this was uh, over a decade ago now. Um, it is interesting that for all the problems I have with that book, that that prediction seems to have been somewhere correct. Which book are you talking about now? Uh, the Tyranny of Theory by Ron Tabor. Ah, that one, yes, yes. 
Um, right. I, I, I think he, I mean, I think that book is suffused with anti-communism in a lot of ways, but there are things in it that I thought were insightful. I agree. I would, I would agree with that, that overall assessment. Um, both, mm -hmm. both sides. I, I was going to ask, so it, it seems like the, that, that anarchism has, which has traditionally kind of had a big place in, in the American left after the new left kind of stalled out, right? Um, it seems to have not died exactly, but it doesn't seem to be as active or as, frankly, that differentiated from standard progressivism as it was when I was, say, in my teens and early 20s. Is that a fair observation? And why do you think that is, if it is true? Uh, I don't know. I, I've seen uh, two sides of anarchism today. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure quite how much they overlap. Uh, one side being those who are, uh, in effect, the, the, the heirs to the uh, insurrectionists, uh, terrorists, uh, people who... You know when, when there were the uh, the George Floyd demonstrations, they participated and they rallied around the most uh, militant, rock throwing violence. Mm -hmm. Although some people organized uh, uh, themselves as medics and, and food suppliers and water bottle suppliers, uh, so there was, there was both types there. Uh, and without, but without a mass demonstration, there's really not a lot of things they can do. Mm -hmm. all being the left wing of the mass demonstrations. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, the DSA has an anarchist caucus, you know, the uh, libertarian, so or they call it the libertarian socialist caucus. And, uh, but their program is precisely what you were saying before the an evolutionary gradualist kind of reformist program of, of building uh, uh, alternate institutions inside society and these will gradually grow until they took over the, the state and the big business and uh, the little businesses and everything else which I call the, the kudzu theory of, uh, of revolution. Uh, wouldn't be evolution at all. Evolution with uh, perhaps at the end a uh, little hiccup of some contract conflict with the state uh, which was as you say the perspective of David Graeber uh, and many others. It's not surprising that in, in the next to last book of Graeber's, or the third to last, the, the one that uh, came out right after his death of, uh, uh, I forget the name of it, uh, Exploring Alternatives, he, he mentions, not, not the big fat book, uh, but by himself, he, he mentions uh, how he has talks, he's there living in, in Britain now and uh, then, and he said he had talks with the, the left of the Labour Party. And they were sort of agreed that it was useful to have uh, militant extra-parliamentary demonstrators and so forth. And, uh, and he was sort of in agreement with the, the Labour Party lefts. And uh, that kind of perspective was not really... A consistent worked out perspective just as the people in the on the left of the uh, uh in the libertarian socialist caucus uh, see themselves building alternate institutions they're working with the uh, and supporting the uh, uh cooperation jackson the uh, project down in mississippi with uh, the jackson where uh, which has included building co-ops and areas in poor black areas and in linking them together, but also included running in the local parliamentary, local elections, uh, which is what it, that kind of reformism pushes you towards. Uh, after all, what do you do if you have your your farmer co-op, uh, farmer neighbor urban co-op of food and so forth, when a local democratic politician comes and says he wants to come to your next meeting and and support you. You're going to say, you know, go to hell because we're an atheist. But uh, actually, the rest of the members who have joined to get cheap food and so forth, and with a, uh, a dash of idealism, see no reason to insult the, 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 the politicians. They think that's all that's good and fine. Uh, so there's, there's this, you know, overlap.
uh, this, the reformist anarchists working together in part in, in the DSA with all the reformist socialists who include both the very liberal socialists and very uh, as well as Leninist socialists uh, who think of themselves as revolutionaries. But you know, if you act like a reformist and work like a reformist and talk like a reformist, then you may think of yourself as a revolutionary, but you are, in fact, a reformist. I wanted to ask you another question. In your particularly far back history, I mean, we're going back to the 60s here, you had, you, you came of a Hal Draper's group, correct? Yes. 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 Um, um, one of the things that I've noticed is that, you know, Trotskyism in my life, in my lifetime, and I'm in my early 40s, has gone through a couple of cycles of seeming decline. Another group comes in uh, after the 80s. They all seem to come from Britain, um, come back seeming decline. But it seems like right now the Trotskyists really are on the way out. Do you have a theory as to why that may be? Like, do they not have a purpose now that the Soviet Union is gone, even though we see Marxism and Leninists popping up, you know, burbling up from the ether? Hmm. Well, I don't know. And of course, at this point, it's all spec in a way, it's all speculation because, mm. uh, on the assumption that there will be increasing left militancy in this country. What tendencies will grow, and which won't, and it depends a lot, of course, on how they handle it, whether they're clever enough about it, and so forth. Uh, and the Trotskyist wave is really, you know, it's really two wings, as you know, historically. Mm -hmm. One that followed uh, Trotsky's theory that uh, Russia was a degenerated worker state because uh, of nationalized property, even under Stalin, even though they disliked Stalin. Um, and those who rejected that, and those became the you know followers of Max Shackman and then and, and Hal Draper. Uh, those people, well, the soft Trotskyists, let's call them, the ones who rejected the the worker state theory, uh, became in this country the the last was the the, the ISO, mm -hmm. one hand and solidarity, or the other. Those are the two main groupings in this country. And at one point, the ISO is the largest left group in the country. Well, nowhere near as large as what the DSA is now. Uh, these folks certainly have uh, the ISO, well, they collapse partly out of their own weaknesses, so in pro their own problems they split up. Perhaps just as the, as the uh, their British co-thinkers and socialist British Socialist Workers Party also crashed for similar reasons, mishandling charges of uh, sexism and sexual abuse uh, by uh, leading comrades. Uh, but they also were pulled into the DSA. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was socialism. This is where it was happening. So rather than keep themselves going, they pulled into that and uh, just abandoned their, news, their magazine and uh, just joined up. The Solidarity uh, kept their magazine and some of their, you know, things like labor notes and uh, labor notes conferences, although their people also went into uh, uh, DSA. So the people around uh, the magazine New Politics, which was also part of the broader tendency, also joined the DSA, but maintained itself as a separate organization, continuing the, uh, the magazine. Uh, the hardened Trotskyists, I'm not sure what most of them did. I do know that the a socialist alternative led by Jeff Mackler uh, is now leading, uh, not only do they have their, their organization, but they're also leading the coalition of the uh, UNAC. Mm -hmm. United, what is it? The United uh, National uh, Anti-War Coalition. Mm -hmm. uh, they were trying to take the major position of uh, on a radical stance against uh, supporting the war in Ukraine. Uh, somehow the very concepts of from Trotsky of uh, supporting of national self-determination of oppressed nations is something that they blanked out there. But uh, uh, now again, they're 
throwing themselves into, of course, into the uh, pro-Palestinian movement. Again, with a stance that doesn't make any criticisms of Hamas, does not say anything negative. Uh, what will happen to all these folks? The soft uh, uh, Trotskyists are tending to just sort of, I suspect, will just sort of blend in mm -hmm. broader social democratic milieu on the left. Uh, you know, there used to be a rule among all the Trotskyists that divided them from the Stalinists so that they would never, ever support the Democrats. But that became a, uh, that was one line that they wouldn't cross. But then when uh, Bernie Sanders ran, there was an enormous pull on that. So even Kim Moody supported uh, the labor group that supported Sanders. You know, he just, how, he couldn't justify from his perspective to say what to say to people about why he wasn't wasn't doing that. Uh, there'll be, you know, plus there's a lot of anti-democratic sentiment inside the DSA, and so they can meld into that part of the DSA. Uh, the hard, hardened Trotskyists, uh, we don't know, I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what'll happen there. They're trying to, making a push, they, they couldn't go that far over the uh, Ukraine issue because it was just, you know, it, it was too unclear, at the very least. It was too uh, hard to say that, you know, let the Ukrainian people be crushed by the Russians. We're all for peace. Uh, but now, with of course, with the Middle East, there's, there's, it's much easier to make it something. This is mar it's the marvelous thing that there's this big anti-war movement developing in this country, pro-Palestinian movement, which we haven't had in many, many years, and. The most exciting thing about it to me is the large number of, of Jews involved, mm -hmm. you know, Jewish, uh, which kind of breaks down the anti-Semitism, weakens the anti-Semitism at least, as well as legitimizes legitimatizes uh, the mass movement. That's as close as I can get. That's uh, the Trotskyists. Yeah, I mean, the hard trots are kind of hard to predict. I mean, the Marxist trots have mostly just become Marxist-Leninists at this point, yeah, right? They, they, you know, yeah, they're not trots anymore at all. Like, oh, not at all. Um, a lot of thing is in the sixties, it was hard to be a libertarian socialist, no matter how revolutionary, because. There was enormous pull from the authoritarian Marxist-Leninist regimes mm -hmm. in China, in Vietnam, in Cuba, which really seemed to be opposing U.S. imperialism. Mm -hmm. And to, there was a great degree of truth in that. They were fighting U.S. imperialism, uh, not actually for a free world of no empires and states, but certainly from their own limited perspective and this is an enormous pull to the left but to a Stalinist left which ranged from which is one reason why the uh, the soft Trotskyists were much weaker than the biggest Trotskyist group was then Socialist Workers Party uh, we have orthodox uh, Trotskyists and uh, similarly they uh, even bigger than them were the Maoists who were more radical and more working class oriented and so forth than the Trotskyists uh, and the Communist Party, you know, going around being along, but that's gone. Mm -hmm. The collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of uh, uh, the, the transformation of China, the, and so forth around the world, uh, makes it much more difficult. Makes it easier to be libertarian socialists, to be an anarchist, or to be a soft Trotskyist, but in some way, uh, and there's much left of, less of a, a pull on them. It's there, you, as you point out, uh, the growth of it partly because you need some kind of radical theory. Uh, the anarchists kind of weak on theory, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a pull towards Marxism and even Marxism and Leninism. A theory that try to get to so you can grapple with what's the state, what's the strategy, what's what's the nature, what's going on. 
Uh, but it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing as being pulled towards an admiration for Uncle Ho and uh, and Castro and uh, Che and uh, let alone Mao. One of the ironies right now of uh, you know th this seeming rebirth of Marxist Leninism is we haven't seen a like a massive expansion of Marxist Leninist parties. Like we we've talked about this. They're they're kind of sprinkled in pockets throughout the DSA. Uh you you'll see them on Twitter. Um yes, there are the old Marxite trot groups that are now Marxist Leninists um, and actually try to out Stalin the Stalinist in most ways. Um but those groups don't seem like they're more than 2000 people in any in any given country and that's being generous um so i, I think you're right that without the actual powers and and yes china still exists and vietnam still exists but they clearly don't really care about that in the same way like at all um it seems like there's just nothing to really for those groups to congeal around other than like alienation from social Democrats of which they kind of still agree with in a lot of ways. Like, so, um, you mentioned though, the anarchists don't have a lot of theory right now. Um, now, uh, reading your work, actually, I became, I became more aware that, they did i mean my my initial vision of anarchism was basically chomsky turned graber because that's what you were exposed to you know like it's just so you're just like well those guys are just democrats just like more morally obnoxious or something um and and i mean in some grades with like chomsky today you see that like him, him mounting these weird defenses of uh almost conspiratorial of jeremy corbyn and whatnot it's just kind of bizarre um the but your work it, it did indicate to me that there was a very live and rich theoretical tradition thinking about states and statehood and that was that was in the kind of first and first international tradition of dialogue around Marxian economics that existed and had a lot of these positions worked out, but that, that kind of anarchism does not seem to be around as much. And it wasn't really when I was in high school either. Why do you think anarchist theory has kind of been thin for the, for the last couple of generations? Well, it's, uh, let's say there is a theory or theories, mm -hmm. uh, and in odd aspects of anarchism. For example, I was came to anarchism through reading Paul Goodman mm -hmm. as a uh, rather developed set of theories about why to believe in anarchy why do uh, why human beings can organize themselves and uh, which apply to a whole wide range of, of things that, and i still think he's very well worth reading even though he was an anarchist pacifist and a gradualist and uh, in many ways essentially a liberal though he would have hated the term uh but i kept some of that as an influence uh, as i became a a, uh, a revolutionary Marxist, influenced, as you say, by the first uh, by the group around Hal Draper. I never met the group out in the West. Well, I did. I met people from the group out in the West Coast, but I was in a smaller group out in New York City, Cy Landy, and some other people. Uh, But there's a background stuff. The anarchists didn't talk about how capitalism worked, but they had a theory about what the possibilities for an alternate society might be like, mm -hmm. which the Marxists did not have. You know, sort of let the workers take power, and then we'll see. Was kind of their attitude, uh, which had a certain advantages. You weren't dogmatic. 
about the future, but at a major disadvantage that when a, a when some group of Marxist led revolutions and established totalitarian mass murdering regimes, you didn't really have a theory about what the alternative should be to Marxists. They, they, you know, this was the product of the historical development and who are we to criticize the way what history has given us kind of attitude. Uh, what's it? Uh, uh, is a reference to by uh, well, whatever. The the point is that uh, there are certain lacunae in Marxism that led to great difficulties. One of them being the lack of the better society, but to, together with the cent centrism and with the very strategy of taking power through the state. Whether that was interpreted either by the in the reformist fashion, getting elected to run over the state, or whether it's seen as revolutionaries overthrowing the state and establishing a new state, their own state, both of which Marx advocated various times in various places. Whether he was there at the root, they're both there, but the central state interpretation, uh, which is why, you know, in a way, I think that the best. The best theory is sort of, a, sort of an integration of Marxism and anarchism, uh, particularly the, the economic theory, which I think is mostly correct, mostly valuable, although always the tools are as good as uh, the craftsperson who uses them. Mm -hmm. uh, the basics for the theory of the state, uh, but not as a political strategy, uh, the way the theory, economic theory, points towards uh, the, the key role of the working class, not as the only revolutionary force, but as a certain way the central force, uh, or at least one of the central forces, these things are all there and it can be integrated. And in fact, there's always been an, a, a libertarian strand in Marxist people whose politics were more or less not all that different from anarchists. Uh, starting with William Morris, uh, up to C.L.R. James, and up to the, the autonomists, uh, and, and so forth, various libertarian Marxists. So I'm not as bothered by the, the weakness of anarchist theory as I, because I think that there's a, a potentiality for getting theory from other places. One of the advantages of anarchism is its openness. It's openness to other forces, other views. My anarchism is influenced not only by Marxism, although I write most about that, but also by uh, uh, radical psychoanalysis, by uh, uh, John Dewey's pragmatism interpreted in, radical, in a radical fashion, uh, by any number of other, by Malcolm X's perspective, uh, any number of feminism, uh, radical feminism, any number of other concepts can be integrated because the basic idea is a belief in freedom and a belief that the liberation of the working class and all oppressed can be only achieved by them, themselves. That old saw from the uh, first international written by Marx, but not invented by him. I recently read one of your essays um I don't know when exactly you wrote it. I, I think it's been in the last decade uh, about class theory of the state and and its history. And I I was struck reading it um, because you're you're very charitable to to Marxist in it because we historically do have a class theory of the state. Um, but I was I was interested in a development that happened. And Marxism starting in the starting with the USSR, where Lenin hints at state neutrality because of the conflict of classes. And this gets picked up and run with as if this the the state could be an unclassed institution, which has always baffled me, even from the Marxist perspective, because you know, no matter how one feels about Lenin, um, he at least admitted that a state requires class divisions to exist, period, end of discussion. 
um his flirtations with that you know with a neutral state seemed to have come kind of opportunistically you know after he wrote state and revolution um but I, I was I found it interesting because it seemed to me that both the Marxist and the anarchist for entirely different reasons had kind of given up class theory of the state. The the Marxists because they see the state as something that they can control. Um, and if you're a reformist Marxist, it's not even a worker state you need to control. It's just a state period. Um, and but with the anarchists, it seems like they have also kind of abandoned class theory of the state. But I'm not as sure why. <laughs> like, um, so uh, where do you think class theory of the state, like, because in historically speaking, like going back to the first international, that is something where, you know, Marxists and anarchists disagree on what to do with the state, but they don't disagree on its ultimate nature, at least not in the 19th century. Like, so why why do you think class theory of the state has become less in vogue amongst anarchists? I mean, I think to me it's clearly that with Marxism it's opportunistic, but but uh it's harder for me to figure that out with anarchists. Well, first of all, I'm I'm uh, puzzled by your reference to Lenin's adopting a classless notion of the state uh I, I don't know what you're referring to certainly it's not in state and revolution it's absolutely not it's it's a it's it's something that he said offhanded in the 1920s that that the that the con not that the state could be classless but that the contestation between classes made the class character of the state a little bit more open um and that was interpreted later by people saying well that you know there's so much class competition that the state is not a classed organ anymore and i was like Okay. Um, well, uh, yes. Uh, first of all, you got to be careful about offhand comments uh, by Lenin or with mm -hmm. anybody else. Uh, certainly, that I, mean, I don't know how to interp interpret that particular reference. It's certainly true that, that the sense that the classes are fighting with each other will uh, have an effect uh, on the state and sections of the state. Uh, uh, but my impression was that uh, Lenin, while Lenin was for running in elections, his perspective was to run elections sort of as a point for propaganda for organizing the working class. Mm -hmm. I think that you could take over the state and uh, change it to uh, use it to create, create socialism as he conceived it. Uh, although he used, they say, the German state. Uh, the German state economy, the German states were during World War One, and the you know, the German, the Prussian post office as examples of the kind of socialism he wanted to create. Uh, the only difference being that instead of a board of directors being elected by uh, the bourgeoisie or appointed or appointed by the bureaucratic state, they would somehow be Soviets on top. How uh, this would affect the ordinary working person going to work with the bosses over them. Uh, whether or not the bosses were eventually in hierarchy at the very top tip top was going to find Soviets was uh, not something he really went into. Uh, in any case, you're absolutely right about the uh, the communists who kind of opportunist means uh, it developed, as I mentioned before, in the US supported the Democrats uh, and FDR during the, the 30s, 40s. Uh, and continue to this day, uh, and, and true throughout the rest of the world, uh, even when they had large scale parties, as in France and Italy for a very long time, they were prepared to make compromises and coalitions with bourgeois parties. Uh, and of course, we know the events history of uh, of Chile, mm -hmm. that, how well that worked out. Uh, now, the point about the how this is, by the way, the theorized is an old question. They have, uh, I was just reading Ellen Meeks Meeksen's Wood, a book on the retreat from class. She's a Marxist, but it's an excellent book, which I widely recommend to people who are interested in class issues. And she's arguing against, 
oh, that wing of the Marxists, post-Marxists, post-leftists who are uh, denying the need for a, a class orientation to look everything, turn everything towards the popular fronts coalition with the liberal bourgeoisie as their main program and have all kinds of complicated theoretical reasons for doing that. And I think she's very good at arguing that. Uh, the thing with the anarchists is uh, somewhat similar in that it's not so much that they deny the class theory of the state, it's that they deny the class theory, period. Unlike the Marxists who had to deal with that theory, uh, with the theory of, of class, which after all was central to Marx, uh, the anarchists didn't have a, not having a, a canon of orthodox statements, you know, written by a towering genius, like as Marx was, uh, they can go in all sorts of directions. Now, following World War II in the post-war prosperity, which started in the United States and then you know, spread through at least through Europe, uh, the other industrialized imperialist countries, uh, it looked like all that stuff about the economy having crises and uh, the working class being driven to revolution and so forth was hooey by the people who had experienced and what they saw out their window. And uh, and not only the anarchists, but of course, of course, the liberals and all variety of capitalist thinkers, but most Marxist theorists. Yeah, Paul Sweezy kind of gives up on I was about a lot of these things. Monthly review the economists and so forth. Uh, today they emphasize more the, their descendants on uh, in the monthly review magazine uh, emphasize more some of the more radical aspects of that theory that well things going to tend towards stagnation and so forth. And they've added analysis of the ecological crisis, uh, which they hadn't you know looked into back then. What was I saying? Oh, why are the Anarchists also looked out the window and uh, didn't see much happening. Uh, where possible, they did get involved in mass struggles. In, in the United States, for example, uh, both the uh, civil rights movement and the anti-war movement, anti-Vietnam War movement, were, how were certainly influenced uh, by radical anarchists, uh, quite, a, quite a few of whom were self-conceived anarchists. Radical pacifists, I'm saying, so who saw themselves also as anarchists, uh, and in, in Britain it was the, the radical pacifists who uh, played a key key roles in organizing the uh, CND, the uh, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. So they were capable of getting involved in mass movements when they when they broke out, but uh, the labor movement had been sort of uh, neutralized after the great big uh, upsurge right after the war, uh, partly by the prosperity, relative the relative prosperity, partly by the horror of uh, what Stalinism was. You want socialism? There's socialism. That's the only socialism there's ever going to be. And, uh, you know, people say, well, I don't want that socialism. Here, here at least I can vote and I can buy my own car and drive wherever I want. Uh, Except, of course, for the very poorest people, not the basis of the uh, civil rights movement, people breaking through through that. So it was hard for anybody to see class struggle as central as a central issue uh, because of the quiescence of the labor movement. Mm -hmm. They had gotten themselves these big unions. They had gotten best raises, at least in certain key areas. And they were satisfied, more or less. They were kept down. There were the, the Taft-Hartley and the various other laws and the uh, anti-communist drives in society in general, as well as inside the labor movement. Uh, one reason why the pacifists survived, they weren't based in the labor movement, like the rest of the left. They were based in the churches. Mm -hmm. put and of course, the churches were not going to be smashed. The churches were, after all, praised and so forth. So they had a certain saving background and they could teach not the idea of nonviolent demonstrations and organizing to Martin Luther King and to others and, and they could how to organize mass nonviolent demonstrations to the 
uh, radical to organize as the uh, anti-war movement. So, uh, so the anarchists were like everybody else. There was no purpose. You know, what do you mean a labor movement? It's only very, very recently that even in the United States there has begun to be a degree of uh, labor movement uh, and upsurge that we've seen recently. It's gradually been building. And of course, not all that radical. But it's potential. Imagine mm -hmm. a general strike in one major city in the United States. Imagine the effect it would have on the whole country and on all the working class to see the potential power that they have. And all our politics are built and organized to keep that people from realizing the potential power that they have. One massive general strike in one big city. And they'll say, wow, we've got this enormous power. But of course, all his effort to keep people from realizing that. And the anarchists, you know, go along with that mostly. They don't see a labor movement, so why should they make labor the central part of the theory? Why do you think that it hasn't, why do you think the anarchists haven't picked back up class struggle in the same way now that? 2007's happened and the relevance of Mark, uh, Marxist economics seems at least kind of back in the four way. I mean, because, you know, when I grew up in the 90s, you would meet the occasional Trotskyist, but there was no one really repping Marxist econ. Um, and that's was definitely not true after 2007, 2008. It was everywhere. But I have not seen, you know, uh similar movements with anarchists to kind of work that out if where anarchists and we talked about the poverty of of theory a little, a little while ago where anarchists were strong as to turn to anthropology i mean this is partly is graber but i mean in general they were you know if i want to talk about people who look at the deep structures of human history um anarchists are usually more likely to be there than marxists are but I did not see a similar like attempt to, uh, you know, I remember when you, your book on um, Marxist economics came out and its name is slipping my, my uh, memory at the moment, but I, I have it or back there somewhere. Um, and you were one of the few anarchists that I knew that was working on economics. It wasn't just assuming chartalism or something, which just that, really did blow my mind because i was like why would I, I really to this day cannot get my brain around why there are so many anarchists who are interested in th theory of money as a positive thing i just can't fathom it um so it uh it, it seemed to me odd that we didn't see a re uh, uh, if not an interest in class at least an interest in a and in, in an economic theory to support um, anarchist analysis. Yeah. I don't know how many did or didn't. Although when we talk about theory in that period, uh, we shouldn't leave out that uh, uh, Murray Bookchin, who still thought of himself as an anarchist, made uh, uh, major contributions in integrating uh, anarchism and to a degree Marxism and ecological thinking. Mm -hmm. They, uh, you know, this and that trend that he started in that uh, was very influential, at least among some. And anarchists in general, both there's a specific social ecological movement that still survives, that's uh, expanded and, uh, and it continues to make uh, useful interventions, uh, raising thoughts and so on. And uh, there is also just a general consciousness of an anarchist now about radical ecology. Mm. Uh, of course, since then, the Marxists have somewhat caught up with us. Uh, the very, as I mentioned before, the very people around the Monthly Review magazine, uh, John Bellamy Foster, and others who dived back into uh, uh, Marx's more obscure comments about uh, ecology and uh, ecolo ecological destruction mm -hmm. and up into a, a useful and uh, major 
uh, theoretical forms that uh, carry on the idea of a radical revolutionary ecological perspective. Any anyway, that anyway that shouldn't be left out. We're talking about you know fair. Anarchy. Uh, as anarchists also play a major role in the it's easily forgotten now in the anti uh, nuclear power movement back then, as as well as the other uh, aspects of the sustaining society. Uh, what was your point? Your question? Oh, I was just asking, like, why was there not a, a turn of class? I guess your answer is, is is fair that in some places there was. I mean, like. Bookchin's municipalist anarchist was very class focused, and um... well, no, no, Bookchin re rejected you know, how much he rejected uh, the working class as a perspective as a revolution. Mm. Uh, so uh, that, that was one of his major arguments against against Marxism. That part of Marxism he took from Marxism the drive to how the the, the drive to accumulate in capitalism. Uh, is a major factor for the ecological uh, unbalance and destruction of society and the destruction of the natural world. He didn't put that together with all well, the drive to accumulate is accumulating what? It's surplus labor. There's no drive to accumulate without the building of the working of working class. It gives them something to accumulate. But uh, and you can't can't give a benefit of that to the uh, the Marxists because uh, ecological thinkers because uh, coming out of monthly review they also downplay the working class as a specific force so they're they're not uh, really don't get credit on that either uh, I wrote an essay on that on, on Bookchin in fact I recently tried to put my some of my works together on uh, on the state and the relation between Marxism and anarchism and uh, I'm trying to get someone to publish it but we'll see how we'll see how that goes so far great success anyway uh i think the major factor is simply as i say uh, empiricism crude empiricism which the united states has more than any place else uh so our tradition of uh, crude empiricism a theoretical thinking and reacting to the environment uh which makes it so much harder to have a working class perspective, especially if you're not starting from Marxism, where after all it's there and you have to, if you're going to be a Marxist, you have to have some, say something about the theory of the labor class. Uh, but an anarchist could be anything. You know, if you're against the state, you're against capitalism, you're an anarchist. Uh, and I'm not one to say if somebody disagrees with me, you know, a different type of anarchist, that there's not really an anarchist. I, I don't like that kind of argument. Uh, I would only say that for uh, fascist anarchists, so-called anarcho-fascists, uh, or little anarcho-capitalists. Mm -hmm. Capitalists is, just became president of Argentina, God help us, so-called anarcho-capitalists, which is not a thing. No, I mean, well... <laughs> I did make a joke that we can finally say that there's an actually existing anarcho-capitalist state, but that was <laughs> all of that is funny to me. Um, uh, and tragic. It's funny because it's tragic. Uh, yeah, anarcho-nationalism and anarcho-fascism uh, actually existing are other things that if you'd have told me in my in my teens and twenties that that was a thing, I would have laughed at you and then ban a the Bay Area National Anarchist existed and and Troy Southgate was pretending to be an I mean I shouldn't say well I think I, mean, I think we can safely say pretending pretending to be an anarchist for a while and and that that was strange um uh luckily it didn't seem to catch on um it seems like you know uh racial nationalism has just sort of decided to recloak itself in just plain old Western chauvinism, if not outright racial nationalism, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to something exotic like <laughs> national anarchism or something like that. But um yeah, yeah that, that the 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 end of the that time period right before and right after Occupy were actually very strange times for ideologies to like bubble up and die really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, 
which I guess does bring me to another question. You mentioned the um, the kind of anarchist adjacent kind of libertarian socialist uh, strains. You, you know, Marx is humanist with C.O.R. James and to a lesser degree, uh, Riot in the Sky. You got um, the autonomous movement. Although I've been wrapping my brain around how the autonomous movement ended up social Democrats in Britain. I've been trying to like understand that for couple years now and it that's always confused me because i was like well the people i learned about owen jones from were autonomous that's weird um but uh there was interestingly i think right before the bernie phenomenon a kind of critique emerging of of the occupy left that tended towards classical left communism either bordigism or um or council communism or some communization weird hybrid um that all that seemed to rise up and die uh, it's yes there's people who still believe it's still around i mean actually like bordiga probably more people know who he is today than 15 years ago by a lot but uh, it does seem I was going to ask you the last time those kinds of ideas have popped up and kind of bubbled up and died away was also right after a, a movement. And it was kind of at the end of the new left where you saw this critique of the new left emerging um, that didn't quite go anarchist, but went real close. And you saw this resurgence of, um, you know, kind of forgotten Marxist tendencies. Uh, Paul Maddock gets repopular and, and printed again. Um uh Bordigas movement out of France. I mean, I know they're out of Italy initially, but the French version kind of becomes popular and weirdly somehow leads to dialogues for primitivism that I don't quite understand. Um, you know, Kamet's rewilding and all that stuff. Um it seemed like we might get another wave of that in, in the 20 teens, and yet it also seems to die pretty like i said we're not die but like stagnate very quickly um do you have a theory as to why it may have not been able to compete with you know is it just the sanders movement well in a way is what i was talking about before the lack of a revolutionary mm -hmm. movement uh at first it looked like you could fight for socialism uh, for a better, which most people didn't, most young people didn't mean, didn't know what the hell it meant, but uh, it meant a better society than what capitalism gives us. Mm -hmm. uh, and here was how to do it, because here, look, it was being done inside the Democratic Party, inside the electoral system. Uh, Sanders was getting close to the nominee. Gee, he might even become president. Uh, although the controllers of the Democratic Party made damn sure that wasn't going to happen. Uh, and look, AOC gets elected and a whole bunch of other people, liberals and uh, uh, social democrats uh, get elected. And gee, that's how it's done. And yeah, it would be more radical than that. Uh, DSA also has sent people to uh, uh, organize and union organizing because they haven't given up on the labor, the working class. Uh, although they're not, they're not organizing against the union bureaucracy it's oh uh, no they make a lot of it these days flat out it would help for the union bureaucracy they do not pitch themselves as anti-bureaucracy but then after all there's so much openness the, <laughs> the unions are so weak and little that there's a lot of a lot of places you can work to help organize unions without getting in conflict with the bureaucracy and we can justify uh holding your head down and just cooperating with them, uh, which makes sense in a place where there's no union whatsoever. Uh, let me see. We started about. Uh, oh yeah, we were talking about like left communists, but I think maybe you you did uh, hit on something there, and that is uh, historically left communists, at least council communists, not all bordigas, but some bordigas are hostile to labor unions because they're hostile to union bureaucracy, but they tend to just also, you know, hold the entirety of the union as 
a problem. And I suppose like that's a hard position to maintain in in the United States where like we don't even have trade union consciousness, like much less, you know, something to push beyond it. <laughs> that, um, that is quite true. The the uh, I was saying it looked easier. It looked mm -hmm. like this was the route forward. And it plus it built a movement. In fact, the socialists and uh, social so DSA is what, 20,000 people? Uh, uh, 60,000, I think, actually. They claim more than that, but I think we can safely say 60. That's right, 60,000? A lot of people. It's about, about as much as the, the communists had during the dep Depression when they were seen as a major force. Of course, uh, it's quite different. The communists were a disciplined, centralized uh, organization with the uh, orders theory coming down from above. So everybody did it, and everybody cooperated, and everybody did the work. Uh, DSA is sort of a you know slob box of a organization, which I'm not arguing against, especially since I don't agree with the general program. I don't want them to be more efficient about it. Uh, you know, plus I'm an anarchist. I believe in a federation, a radical federation, rather than a I don't believe in democratic centralism. Yeah, natural that some people looking to theory uh, after we know some people were attracted to after the 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 open uh, open city kind of things uh, they occupy uh, in the occupy movement some people would turn to well what else is there that leads towards cooperation and decentralization and so on. It's also revolutionary. Uh, they were right to look in that direction. The and certainly the council communists, uh, you don't have to agree with everything they said, but the idea of a council organization as an alternative and as an alternative to Leninist party communism, uh, there's a lot to learn, the democratic perspective and so forth. Yes, they were wrong about the unions. That part, uh, Lenin was right, if, if I can use that. The <laughs> revolutionary should work in, build unions and should work in some of the existing unions where the masses of people are. Uh, they were right about uh, opposition to uh, uh, electoralism, through parliamentary stuff. Lenin was wrong on that. Uh, that's my perspective there, my modification of this. And of course, uh, it was dangerous, I thought, that there was an increased interest in Bodega, because Bodega was a uh, super Leninist, super centralist, didn't believe in democracy at all. Didn't believe. No, I mean, he believed in democracy less than Lenin did by a lot. <laughs> right. He, he was uh, even worse than Lenin. Combining the ultra leftism, uh, sectarianism was combined with a perspective of uh, authoritarianism. If an organization runs from the run from the top down and uh, no democracy, but somehow you all know how things should be done. Now I know some people who admire him or say he had good things to say about this, that, and the other thing, which may be true. Uh, you know, uh, Lauren uh, Gold Goldman, for example, mm -hmm. writes uh, an ultra left uh, Marxist, writes interesting stuff. You can look up his uh, website. Uh, and uh, also tends to many of the ultra left uh, errors, uh, but is a, a revolutionary and has made important contributions. And others of them make, you know, and he finds something interesting in the day of the side. side. And I think there are some people, in fact, who, as you say, are on integrate uh, Bodega's, some aspects of Bodega's stuff, probably mostly the, the sectarianism, together with the. Uh, the democratic aspects of the council communists. I'll give you an example about the sectarianism. Uh, when I was a Trotskyist, we all learned about uh, Trotsky's proposals to fight the, the Nazis and the fascists in Germany, uh, to form a united fronts, fighting united front with the, the, the communists and the social, social democrats. What I didn't know is that earlier, when the fascists started organizing in Italy, anarcho-syndicalists tried to form a, a very similar strategy of working together. They try to get together the communists and the social democrats. Uh, also, uh, 
the radical the Republicans, you know, extreme kind of revolutionary, but still liberal in that sense. They want to get rid of the king. Uh, and a number of places did manage to get them together to drive the fascists from the streets. But they couldn't do it on a national level, on a consistent level, partly because the Social Democrats believed that they could sign an agreement with the fascists. They, they did sign an agreement, to, uh, non, non-aggression, which, of course, the fascists immediately you know, ignored. Uh, but also the communists, who were led by Bordega at the time, with his lieutenant being... Uh, uh, Gramsci, being Gramsci mm-hmm. at the point, uh, opposed any united front with other forces, even other groups, socialist and working class unions, and so on. Yeah. And any any united front, unless they, the communists, could control it. So they, from their side, they sabotaged an attempt to build a united front to fight against the fascists in. Uh, in Italy, preceding the later, not so long later, uh, ultra-leftism of the Stalinized Communist Party in Germany, which did similar kind of stuff. Yeah, I I honestly have never quite understood. There are things that Bordega said that I admired, like he was one of the few people who stood up to Stalin's face and just walked out of the room, but like... I have never quite understood the the ignoring that, you know, his main complaint about Bolshevism is that it was too democratic, which is a strange thing to think about. And then when you look at what he proposed, you know, he opposed democratic centralism, but what he wanted to replace it with was organic centralism and from what i can tell and i've read a lot of this stuff uh that was mostly just technocracy i guess it wasn't even like you know it was the idea was like oh the the best technocrats in the party will rise up and they're like the best brains of the working class but i'm like but i don't see how this won't end up being um um kind of managerial elite e- even from a marxist perspective this seems a little bit sus um so you know it i had a, my, my personal theory was that the only reason he gets considered a left communist is because lenin put him in the in the polemic that's really pretty much it and, and i mean the irony of of that is like he you know bordega's main argument was you know I'm more Leninist than Lenin is. I like I actually understand what Lenin means and Lenin doesn't. Um and sometimes when I, you know, I have a very I have an a skeptical ambivalence about about uh Lenin. Um, you know, I think historically we can say how that all went. Um but uh Every now and then I, I actually think about what Bordega says. And I'm like, well, maybe Bordega was onto something that he actually understands implications in Lenin that Lenin's not admitting. And like the reason why Lenin doesn't like him is he's saying the quiet part out loud. Um Yeah, uh, but you know, that's pure speculation on my part. Um I guess you know we can we can start to 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 wrap up, but I, I wanted to uh ask you, I, I re- uh, you sent me an article that uh about recent attempts by some by two Trotsky scholars to re-engage with anarchism. And um I found it interesting the attempt to uh de-Stalinize Che Guevara in that uh, and make him somehow more adjacent to anarchism. And I, I found it interesting now because weirdly Guevaraism right now is probably the least relevant it's been in my lifetime like it doesn't seem to have the same purchase that it did when i was a a teen um why do you think they did that and 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 what do you think it says about the future of of anarchist marxist like dialogue well the problem is of course what as you're it's coming out with what you're saying is the authoritarianism on the left, mm-hmm. including on the far left, 
you're on the far, far left, uh, that Bordega is uh, not just regarded as a crackpot who has, or somebody who has some interesting things to say here and there, uh, but after all, here's somebody who's to, disagreement with democratic centralism is he doesn't like the part about demo democratic. And that's pretty weird, you know. Uh, he was far left because he was sectarian. Mm -hmm. And that's why he walked out on Stalin. I hate to say Stalin was right, uh, so I won't, but uh, the idea that working people should try to work together, that revolutionaries should Try to make alliances with reformist socialists, only to expose the socialist reformist leadership. Uh, these were good ideas, and as I said, in fact, the anarchists had already, the anarchist so, uh, uh, syndicalists had already tried some of this. Mm -hmm. you no, know, and uh, Bordega destroyed it. Was one of those who destroyed it, along with the Social Democrats' reformism and stupidity. Uh, and the same thing, you know, Guevara, well, he didn't die in power. He died trying to overthrow states. Mm -hmm. So that looks more romantic and more attractive than anybody else. Of course, especially, it may not affect us that much, but certainly in Latin America. The image of somebody who fought as a revolutionary and then died in the and then murdered by the, the uh, military and so forth and so on. The fact that he was a stone authoritarian. I wrote a whole article on that, by the way, based on uh, uh, Sam Farber's last book on uh, Che Guevara's politics, uh, who didn't believe that the ordinary people workers should really run things. Uh, he believed they should take orders from the smart people on, on top. He would have agreed with uh, with uh, uh, Bodega on that. Uh, he even admired uh, uh, the what's the book facing facing forward. The, mm -hmm. the one the guy goes falls asleep and wakes up in the far future where it turns out everything is socialized. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's all it's all socialized and cooperative, but it's all authoritarian and undemocratic and run by a bureaucracy and so forth. And Guevara uh, said that he liked it. That's what he wanted to achieve. That's what he wanted to create. But it's a there's an it's attraction to people, partly because they don't think it through, partly because what's the most immediate thing? Partly because people raised in America, after all, aren't very democratic. You know, neither the left nor the right seem to really uh, look at this, this current debate about free speech. Neither the left nor the right is crazy about free speech. Or the other guy, as Rosa Luxemburg said, free speech, freedom is always for the other person, for the person to disagree with, she wrote. That's why she's one of. Uh, uh, there's a great revolutionary Marxist uh, because of what you said about that. I remember when I read Hal Draper's theory of uh, Marxist theory of revolution, the five book massive oh. tome. Um, but the it really did convince me that we should take free speech a little bit more seriously because Marx did. I mean, like it was a you know and. And to some degree, even Lenin gave it lip service selectively, although would also find reasons to repress it by pretending that, you know, Marxists opposed bourgeois revolutions as opposed to like just criticize them for not being good enough. Um, I find uh, I have found um, going through your work and rereading anarchist work. I, I don't know that I would consider myself an anarchist these days, but it is refreshing <laughs> to to read people who are at least thinking through the obvious things about the state and exploitation like if we have to do, if we have to donate our surplus to maintain a a standing group of armed men who don't do any other labor there's a class there there's no way there's not like um 
And if you ignore that, I don't like to me, you're ignoring the mission of socialism, whether you're an anarchist or a Marxist. But, you know, I feel like we definitely live in an age part of it's being from America, but we definitely do live in an age where the left is both revitalized, but also like coming from a place of being so stunted. Um, you know, for that gap between the new left and what happened post 2007, 2008, um, that it does feel like we're just replaying a lot of the same problems that we played in the middle of the 20th century again. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing either. I just, you know, it definitely seems to be a thing. <laughs> because the problems weren't solved. Mm -hmm. So it keeps on repeating itself. You know, there's a constant uh, cycle of return of the repressed. The problem is that things are more dangerous now. I am uh, I'm optimistic on one side, but on the other hand, I am uh, scared as hell about uh, the rise of fascism in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, coming through that one of the two major parties in this country is is certainly authoritarian committed to an authoritarian and racist uh, repressive outlook and uh, I am also worried as hell about the predictions about uh, uh, the global warming and the climate change which is uh, they just they're just not doing anything I'm, I'm hoping I was hope oh, I mean it's clear that we're not gonna have a revolution in time but uh, I hope at least that I wanted a mass movement I want a mass movement that will at least put such pressure on them that they'll Maybe slow it down for a time, mm -hmm. give us a chance to, to grow. Uh, I don't know if that they'll do that. You know, you can. The, the job of the state, after all, is to take the the wisdom of the, partly of the overall capitalist class, which is a very stupid class and based in uh, kind of conflict, enormously conflictful and uh, competitive and, and vicious among them themselves. Is the Say, well, this is what we have to do in order to keep the whole system going, as Roosevelt did in the New Deal, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not doing that with with uh, the environment. They're finally doing a little something, but it's so inadequate that it's almost almost it would be laughable, you know. And uh, as has been said, the the problem is uh, uh, Mother Nature doesn't care about. The bourgeoisie's incompetence. Mother Nature doesn't care that uh, uh, Biden means well, but it's just those nasty Republicans. They just won't let him pass him stronger laws. Uh, the laws, of Mother Nature, which is that is to say, the laws of physics, don't give a damn about political problems in the United States Congress. And they're just going on to do their business. And uh, so this is all this is kind of frightening, and I'm I'm hoping for a qualitative another qualitative upsurge at some point. Not necessarily say not necessarily a revolution, but at least a major upsurge uh, as close as the '60s, or maybe a combination of the '60s and '30s, but with both labor and uh, youth and and the environment and cultural matters uh, together to, to shake the system up and at least make them pull themselves back. Uh, uh, not give us fascism and not, you know, you know destroy the world. Yeah. It does seem like we're in very much radicalization or barbarism moments. Um, That's well put. <laughs> That's a very good statement, yes. We're, we're in a socialism or barbarism moment. Um, uh, what are the ironies of doing... Uh, a kind of socialist communist podcast is it's a podcast and thus still in the realm of petty bourgeois rentierism. So uh, in light of that, uh, is there anything uh, you'd like to plug? <laughs> well, just a moment. Okay. okay. This is the book that uh, there it is. <laughs> called The Value of Radical Theory. Uh, the subtitle, which is more informative, says An Anarchist Introduction to Marxist Critique of Political Economy by Wayne Price and published 
by uh, AK Press. And it's, it's a little book. You don't, you don't take that long to read. And it tries to present, uh, since I'm neither a Marxist nor an economist, uh, it tries to present in a clear and understandable way the basis of a Marxist e economy and an anarchist comments on, on commentary on uh, those views. I, I will endorse that book. It was pretty meaningful for me to read. And uh, I will also endorse a book that it, you have that I think is also available for free at the Anarchist Library, which is the Marxist and Anarchist Theories of the State, which is a bunch of stuff in historical comparison. So, so there's two things. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. I hope you send me an announcement of uh, when you get it ready to produce. Thank you.